And it is at this time that it, I have the great pleasure of introducing our first guest speaker, Dr. Chris Hurenko. He came to us from Saskatoon. Uh, he is the director of the Irene and Doug Schweizer Center. Um, and Chris is going to talk to us today and give us uh, some theological foundation for why as people of faith, we ought to care about the climate emergency that is facing us and allow us for uh, to have some great conversation and stimulating questions. So without further ado, Dr. Chris. All right, um, so thank you so much for having me here. So I'm Chris, uh, I live and work on Treaty 6 territory, which is Niha Yalans and the whole land of the Métis Nation. Um, part of my background is that I've been ecumenically trained, uh, including with a doctorate in theology with a concentration in Christian ecological ethics. And I would have been very happy to talk uh, specifically about climate emergency, but what I understood my task was today was to talk about these two concepts. Um, but if we want to talk about climate emergency, I literally just reviewed a book on climate emergency last night, so uh, <laughs> we, can, we can do that. Um, but it's, this is related. So I've been asked by Tash and Laura to provide some theological foundations for creation care and ecological conversion. Um, to do that in 15 minutes. <laughs> and then uh, to move to provide you with some discussion starting questions, which will be on the last slide, which you can use or not uh, to help stimulate your discussion on care for creation and ecological conversion in small groups. And then moderate a synthesis discussion based on folks sharing insights from those small groups. So this is uh, three movements uh, about considering care for creation and ecological conversion. And that's what we're gonna do together for this hour. Yes, perfect. Okay, so care for creation is a fascinating and rich term, theologically speaking. Applied in Christian contexts, it implies that the natural world has a quality as created, uh, with the creator being God. Further, most Christian theologians employing care for creation as a term see creation as having spiritual value. The spiritual value is conceived and named in interesting ways, which for the most part can be held together in creative tension. And I'm going to now move to survey some of these ways. So care for creation and creation care seem to have their origins in evangelical Christianity. For example, perhaps appearing as early as the 1960s to give a faith-inspired frame to the environmental movement expressed in such writings as Rachel Carson's 1962 book, Silent Spring. And that movement and those writings align really well with older US Calvinist understandings of duties to protect nature and the natural. Uh, which, for example, helped establish the U.S. national park system. Since then, it has gained ecumenical traction in the work of the World Council for Churches and amongst a wide variety of theologians, initiatives, and movements from mainline and orthodox Christianity. In 1989, the ecumenical patri patriarch Bartholomew, who's the spiritual head for many uh, Eastern Orthodox Christians, established September 1st as the World Day of Prayer for Care for Creation. Uh, he was then followed in this initiative by many European Protestant churches, embracing that initiative in 2001. And then Pope Francis also recognized the World Day of Prayer for Care for Creation in 2015. Last November in his teaching directed to COP26 uh, taking place in Glasgow, Pope Francis characterized creation care as one of the great moral challenges of our time. Yeah, something uh, sorry. That's okay. sorry about that. My students would find this hilarious that I could do this so quickly, but here we go. So sources <laughs> of, of creation care uh, ethics from academic theologians or for academic theologians. Um, so Francis talked about that moral dimension of creation care and that moral dimension is really important and it's never far from the surface for academic theological reflection on care for creation. So to look at some of these sources, any of which we can talk about more um, in, after in the discussion period, uh, I have just identified sort of six that I'll talk through uh, very quickly. So these are prime examples and where people are looking for the source, the theological source of an ethic of caring for creation. So the first one I wanted to mention is the naming of God's creation or God's good world. And this is in a possessive sense, using the possession to say that we don't really own anything that creation as created belongs to God, properly belongs to God. 
Um, famously and somewhat controversially, there's also this idea of the universe as being imaged as the body of God, which is from Sally McFaig, uh, who uh, ended her life in Canada, just passed away a couple of years ago now. And then there's the orthodox and biblical inspired um, concept of the cosmic Christ that, for example, sees Christ, and this is Christ, the eternal firstborn of creation, as distinct from the person Jesus, um, sees Christ in all things. Um, and this is a small eye incarnation, so that, for example, Christ is even present in the grain of sand. Uh, fourth, there's a reimaging of the Trinity as inseparably linked. And then these names uh, apply to the persons of the Trinity. So creator, sustainer, and redeemer. Um, and then uh, fifth, something that I, I really find uh, quite appealing myself is the lived reality of Jesus. Uh, Jesus taking on the mantle of the poor Christ and thus being a model of kenotic chosen simplicity. So Nick, what is kenosis? Oh, okay, Tasha, <laughs> what is <laughs> kenosis? <laughs> what Do you remember? <laughs> it's okay, I would tune me up too. Okay, so what is kenosis? Uh, kenosis is a Greek word that means to empty yourself to what Christ did on the cross, empty himself to take on Okay. And so that, so uh, Tasha just referenced the, the radical emptying that takes place, for instance, and most uh, profoundly on the cross, and how some, someone who is fully human and fully divine can suffer such a faith, such a fate, endure such a fate. That emptying to be part of all of creation is a really interesting uh, aspect of the cosmic Christ. Uh, uh, Self limitation for growth, right? Um, and then sixth, as kind of an ecological triangle that sees proper relationships to the land and its natural community as inseparable, inseparable from proper relationships uh, to God and other people. So if, if one side of this triangle is broken, the other two sides display damage. Okay, that's a whole course in <laughs> uh, slide. <laughs> Um, and then, so this idea of ecological conversion uh, draws on comparable and related insights. The, the term was first used in a prominent Christian context by John Paul II in 2001 to name an aspect of moral conversion that was necessitated by the crises of our time. These are the interlocking crises of biodiversity loss, the climate emergency, um, ecological crisis, the social crises, and the cultural crises that he was very um, fond of standing upon. Um, so the Laudato Si movement, on, on which I sit in the Canadian advisory circle, divide, defines ecological conversion as follows. It says, it's the transformation of hearts and minds towards greater love of God, each other, and creation. It is a process of acknowledging our contribution to the social and ecological crisis and acting in ways that nurture communion, healing, and renewing our common home. So this ecological conversion is about relationship with Jesus Christ overflowing horizontally into a concern for human and ecological neighbors, seeing all this as a tangled bank from which we can never authentically remove ourselves. Um, so for us, uh, ecological conversion erases the idea that you could ever be an atomic individual. So thus ecological conversion is not just individual, but must be communal. It's about taking responsibility for and responding with inspired creativity in the face of social and ecological crises. Each ecological conversion in this integral sense is starting to gain ecumenical and interfaith traction as faith inspired folks strive to discern the promises and perils of locating themselves within webs of ecological and social relationships, seeking to make their participation in the world positive and transformative. So I think I'm good for time. And if we go to the next slide. So that's about ecological conversion is about participation. Um, and much more interesting and allowing the conversation to develop more organically is if we break apart and we think about these ideas and you can add to the three um, ideas, the climate emergency, if you like, I can handle it. Or, but these are six discussion starting questions that are very much leading questions are things that I would like to talk about if I had had more time.
Um, so what we were thinking is that uh, maybe at your tables or maybe combining a couple of tables that have two people, if you could um, talk either using these questions or something that you feel moved to share, then I'm gonna ask in the synthesis portion, which I think will be our main portion, uh, for someone from your group to report back like the insights, the key learnings from this little discussion. Um, I'm gonna, to make sure that we uh, can cover all the topics, if you choose to use these questions, I would like folks that are like going around Nick like this, to start from six and go up. And then these folks could go from one to three. Okay, so we'll come back together. So, and uh, what we have is so the people that are online can hear, we have a microphone that we'll pass around to the tables. And we'll just sort of ask you to report back on insights that emerge from your discussion. They don't have to be related to these questions, but um, as talking through with this table, you'll see that these are very much leading questions of other topics that I think are important and relevant to talk about. Um, I can also say very briefly and off the top of my head without uh, preparation, theological sources for dealing with the climate emergency are connected to what I talked about. But it, other things that you can think about is, for instance, the air as the breath of God. That's been very popular. So the life-giving breath of God that's talked about in Genesis 2 if that's if that is the air and you damage the air um, then within this reality of connectivity that can be very harmful um, to your spiritual and physical well-being um, and then other ideas uh, related to ecological justice are really important for the climate emergency um, so that basic moral lesson that those who are least responsible are often paying the greatest cost uh, is a form of cosmic injustice and a lot of people think that um, God is upset by cosmic injustice and would be disappointed um, in such outcomes. So those are, I think those are just off the top of my head, two of them, the main things, but others can emerge organically. So uh, this table, um, we'll just ask for someone there to sort of talk about um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, insights. <laughs> Um, well, we, well, I, I burst in and, and we didn't stop this one. <laughs> um, I, I would like to suggest that maybe Christianity as a way to do this is, um, is it may be somewhat suspect in that, um, it, that Christianity has so much to answer for in terms of being the, the major colonizer of, of people and along with colonization, uh, the complete destruction of the land. Um, and and the, and often the enslavement and um, domination of people in it, and so that um, we can that you, you could get there. Um, we might we might use some of the concepts of Christianity to encourage us on, but in fact, naming it as Christian isn't necessarily the best um, advertising slogan when you consider what some of the other faiths might do. In, from their origin about how they were connected to the land in the first place. And the religion is integral, uh, and the land is integral to them. And so that, um, so that I think we have a lot to answer for in the, not just the connection to the destruction of the land, the part that European, um, if we could say it as, as um, maybe Christian in its history at least, um, had, had everything to do with capitalism, which was about, say, let's take let's get all the land we can and say, shall we plant, plant wheat on every aspect of the world? Like we can just look around in this area to see how the natural aspect of it is, is really given over to making money. And as far as uh, if that being uh, uh, a European and a Christian um, relation in history, uh, maybe naming it as a, Christ, as a Christian movement to be ecological, is not necessarily a good advertising slogan in the first place. The end. <laughs> so do I, do I need to talk into this? Uh, you definitely need to talk into the mic. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'll give it to the next table. Okay, so this is, um, this is our key point. Uh, this was one of my leading questions as 
so lots there, lots there in that comment, and I'll try to unpack it and make sure that um, I don't want to sound apologetic. So I want to say why it's important to treat this from a Christian perspective, but I also want to acknowledge the point. So I went through um, and I did all the required courses for the environmental studies program. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, so in the early 2000s, uh, I went through and I did all the required elements for the environmental studies program at the University of Manitoba. And at that time, uh, your comment makes me think of two things. First of all, we never engaged uh, religious and spiritual traditions with one exception that I'll talk about in a sec. Um, and we know now, and uh, something that I think is really important, and something that I appreciate being in the Department of Religion and Culture and, and being on the board of Faith and the Day, is that this interfaith cooperation going across religious traditions to work on with different motivations, um, often overlapping, often parallels, often interesting things that we can talk about in terms of dialogue, but taking different motivations to work on these issues is really important. And there are sources for ecological ethic um, in other non-Christian religious traditions that might be less controversial, uh, might be more apparent, um, and might be more nourishing, and might be more necessary because of the aspects of colonization, capitalism, and Christian involvement with those things. Um, so I would never want to discount those. And in fact, as, as I say, uh, I was, I think I remember I was initially hired to teach Christianity ecology at St. Thomas More College, uh, but even my college didn't want me to teach Christianity ecology, so we made a religion in ecology, and it's much better. Um, okay, so I go through that program in environmental studies, major respect on the big three required courses. The one dimension that there was of any religious or spiritual tradition was about Christianity. It was this idea that Christianity gave this license to exploit nature. Um, and the reference was to a limited but popular reading of this article by Lynn White Jr. in uh, 1967, super excited about every academic once. Um, but, the, but the idea is. Does this like dominion imperative that's for instance present in the first creation story in Genesis, does that give license to exploit nature? Does it give license to commodify nature? Does it desacralize nature in contrast to like, for examples that we have around us of Buddhist understandings of indigenous understandings of nature? Um, does that then allow for this colonialism, Western expansion, uh, capitalization of nature, um, all the things that, by the way, pay my salary because of our economy in Saskatchewan, right? So, so it's really interesting and important um, question. But I think it's also really key to say, to talk about this from Christian perspectives amongst Christians because of the counter narratives um, that really do support that. Um, so the prime example I already mentioned that I have of this is there was in Ronald Reagan's cabinet, um, the Secretary of the Interior was very keen to drill um, in national parks and to log in national parks. And one of the justifications that he apparently shared in the context of the cabinet was that if we kept that nature intact, it'll delay the second coming of Christ, <laughs> right? So you have to get things as bad as possible so that Christ will come again to save us. Um, the idea, that many, that many of our dialogue partners at St. Thomas More College have, have reflected upon um, and the way that Catholicism, for instance, treated indigenous cultures to view uh, connection to nature as pagan is actually maladaptive. So to show that there's ways to respect nature, to see nature as sacred, to understand Christ's presence and even the grain of sand, right? That is important so that you don't leave Christianity just to that discourse of it's a license to destroy nature. I think it's actually really important. Two billion Christians in the world, there's a place for the intra-Christian conversation, but I 100% agree and don't think it just stopped there. But I think the real challenge today is to be at least pragmatic enough, at least um, what they call eschatological delay in dialogue to say, okay, fine, I have Christian beliefs, uh, but I'll put aspects of those aside to work on common projects that are good for humanity and good for the world. And that's really where we need to go. So I hope that addresses kind of that point. Okay, so maybe I'll look at the first one then, um, character creation. Um, in our discussion, the, um, um, uh, 
there was the framework model and the stewardship model. And the targeted or framework model we thought would be easier to sell, but more limiting. And because you're focused on one issue, distracting from other important work that is ultimately connected. So stewardship advantages were um, broader. So the advantage of a, a framework would be you can focus, but the disadvantages it, it leaves you working on one thing. In the stewardship model, which I think we agree was our preferred model, um, the advantages are it is broader, can attract more people who have a different passion for a piece of the work that works towards bringing us towards bettering the world. The disadvantage is that um, people for stewardship is that people can work in silos and they need to get together and make the connections. So our preferred model in general was the framework or the stewardship, pardon me, because it is more encompassing and more likely to result in things like networking and, and uh, making connections and building relationships that touch on other areas because, you know, as we were saying, um, for sure in the five pillars of Kairos, there's refugee work, there's justice work, um, indigenous justice work, there's climate justice work. And the more you get into it, the more you see that they're all connected. They all touch on each other. They all feed into each other. They all um, are affected by each other. So we like the framework model. Stewardship model. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you get for making these models. <laughs> Yeah, so I'll talk, I think this is uh, so two things from your comment that really um, um, strike me is um, related to this idea of ecological conversion is seeing these justice initiatives that seem to be social justice initiatives as not isolated, as overflowing into the ecological and vice versa. And it's almost redundant to say that ecological justice is also social justice, but that's something that's needed to be emphasized in a lot of uh, Christian articulations, because uh, a lot of people are very scared um, that, that come from a social justice oriented um, perspective within Christianity, that if they focus on ecology, they'll somehow be letting that go. Um, but seeing this like ecological conversion, seeing it as webs, seeing it as interconnected, means that there's always different places to start. And um, I imagine that Kairos has this imaging as well, um, that the five pillars are connected, are interrelated, do overflow, do overlap, and that that's part of like this ecological uh, wisdom. So um, I asked this question because I, I looked on the Archdiocese of Regina website that we attached to this thing. And I remember uh, we both had the same instructor in uh, Toronto, Dennis O'Hara, and he hated this idea of the stewardship model. So my new thing to try to build bridges is to think, um, and so he really hammered it to me that you should never talk about stewardship because it was very hierarchical. But I think part of what you're saying uh, resonates with an experience I've had since being in Saskatchewan. And it has to do with that first model of creation care that I talked about, about thinking about creation as gods and properly gods. Um, and also because of actually uh, Muslim Christian dialogue that we do um, at the college. The idea of stewardship, of being a, a steward, means that it's not ultimately yours, that you have responsibilities. So what are you doing? This is related to what um, we'll call them table one, or equal table one. Um, <laughs> This idea of what do you do in this world? What do you do with this world? And stewardship might fit with people's understanding. And it might be a reason to respect creation. It might be a re re uh, reason to work for social justice. Uh, and like you say, it might be a way to unite things that otherwise seem disparate or disconnected. So it's a very um, important idea. So Dennis wasn't particularly happy with care for creation either as a framing, but initially I thought of that as, as more integral 
But the tension uh, that I pointed to um, at the beginning is when you start talking about it, so if we're working across boundaries, when you start talking about uh, the natural world as creation, that brings in a certain moral imagination, but it also excludes different viewpoints. So for instance, um, ecological secular thinkers would be very taken aback by thinking of nature as creation or the natural world as creation or us as creatures, um, even though they work to uh, remove hierarchies. And there's other faith traditions that don't have a view of creator God like Christians do. So creation care can be problematic as well. Uh, what I think is really interesting is that creation care has moved across boundaries from these evangelical origins to being embraced by mainline uh, Christianity, Orthodox and Protestant traditions. That address your okay, let's say what your house. Okay, so uh, we looked at the question, we started with a question before because we did work in the work. Um, so question four is how can ecological conversion be fostered as an essential part of Christian faith life? Um, so we said, you know, it starts with teaching and, of course, with a spiritual practice. So um, with prayer, liturgy, solidarity, um, and that we go back to sources of our faith tradition. And that this isn't actually, you know, something that's new. It's something that many of our forebears have talked about. It's in our scriptures um, and that there might be um, some really good uh, traditions for us to go back and to retreat and to live that out in our current context and that these practical or sorry that these spirit the spiritual conversion will then lead to the practical applications so the recognition that we're part of a community is going to impact the way that we treat our sisters and brothers that we are going to live our lives and care for the land that we own and the actions that we take and how we buy and consume things. Um, we also talked about the that we we live this out by love and service. And so if we're going to be serving individuals, we have to take into mind the environment in which they live. We are not isolated beings. We are creatures, part of creation, and that um, one of the things Dennis always said is you can't have you know healthy people on a sick planet our environment impacts the way we live and um, our ability to to do what we were created to do um, and so we also talked about the fact that you can't we can't save the world but we all have um, this is my phrase a sphere of influence so there's certain people and that you have impact on or certain contexts. Maybe you're really involved with your municipal government. Uh, maybe you are in a position where you get to write policy or where you get to look uh, after others, whether that's your own family or you know, other people that you care for. And so that we you know, put our brick in um, and that through our actions and the integrity that we live with, that that is a witness for living out the gospel. And we don't have to be preachy about it and like colonizing, but we just do it like Nike, stand <laughs> slave labor. <laughs> I, love, I love you. <laughs> yeah, not much. I think I think Tasha could have done this uh, set for herself. But the uh, there's not much to add there. But I just wanted to highlight um, this idea of witness here. And that is one of the things, interestingly enough, that I was thinking about in asking that question. Uh, this is something that I learned um, from, uh, I was on Catholic Monday Dialogue for a while. And we talked about this in the context of, of peace and peace building and what you can do in the world. So you're, you're, this is related to your idea of uh, sphere of influence. And sometimes you have to say, well, these are the values that I stand for. And maybe I'm not going to be transformative in the sense that I would hope for or imagine or would aspire to, but I can always be a witness for these values. And that you control as in your sphere of influence. And I think that that's uh, pretty profound there. 
Um, in the spirit of participation, are there people online who have said things? <laughs> Do you want to be the voice of the online folks? Somebody want to speak up for one of your groups? I will. For group number three, room number three, we spoke about experiencing ecological conversion and we we said yes but um we have experienced but we needed ongoing conversion uh and it's a process not just a single moment and part of it is our history and our background uh, if we were bought, brought up frugal we carried that forward and we might have forgotten it when we became much richer but we quickly moved back into that when it, we could see the ecological value of it. Um, and so there are many different components in that, that conversion wasn't simple. Thank you, Mark. Um, so this is actually a really uh, important point about ecological conversion, is that often the way that it's presented is that it would be sort of an insight-based conversion, meaning you'd go through like a learning process and then you would see. But um, if you take, I don't want to get too technical, but you can take different starting points for conversion. And uh, for instance, Bernard Lonergan says that one of the starting points is what he calls moral conversion. That's conversion based in action. So the example that I use, um, having taught uh, school kids, I used to call them, um, well, I, I called them sort of recycling Nazis, which was the best thing to do. But they would get very intense, right, on this idea. They knew it was a good thing. They didn't have a justification. They didn't see the level of a relationship reason. But they just knew it was a good thing. And because they were into uh, recycling, which is minimal uh, ecological participation, uh, later on, I had the pleasure of teaching. So I taught kids in school and then was able to teach them in the university in Manitoba. And so they, no, I didn't. So I saw them, some of this group of students come through uh, and take this sort of ecological ethics class that we were teaching uh, in Manitoba and seek out reasons for commitments they already had. So the, in, that, in that sense, the conversion worked in, in a different direction. The other direction that Lonergan would imply that you could have conversion from is sort of mystical and love experiences, uh, falling in love with creation, falling in love with justice. And that can be a motivator to seek out. And if you think of these as kind of like a triangle, this moral conversion, conversion based on action, this insight based conversion, conversion based on education, or, and this love based conversion, they can, they're interconnected and they should flow into each other, but you can start at the end. And yes, um, the other thing that Mark said is it's a process. Um, so I was kind of uh, tactful on this in the question. I said something like aspects of people I was converting. Have you experienced aspects of ecological conversion? Because it's never meant to be a finished process. It's something that's always supposed to be open to revision and updating as you get new experiences. Uh, now that we've talked about it, maybe based on love, maybe based on action, maybe based on listening. So thank you, Mark. Okay, is there anyone else on the line? Yes. Um, our, our group talked about two questions, the faith buildings and the theological backgrounds in regards to the structure of, of how you move forward. And in both cases, we, we discussed uh, challenges that, that, were, that we were facing that was stopping us from moving ahead right now and the challenges and what the right ways of doing things were. And we all had experiences uh, both in and outside of the church of how those different things can be addressed. And we talked about how uh, different organizations might be able to uh, help guide so that we can efficiently move forward. Because we all have, everyone in the church has different backgrounds. So you drop down to the lowest common denominator of understanding and, and moving forward. So it's best to, it would be best. And uh, what some of us were seeking were uh, project uh, templates uh, lay out how best to proceed uh, in a way that is uh, beneficial to all and, and that has been proven to work for both the building of the congregation, the discussion, and the buildings. Yes, thank you, Trey. Um, so that's something I, I want to put in that question because um, it's something that's going to be talked about explicitly today, that there are uh, practical aids 
but the basic point there is to think of uh, your building also makes a statement about who you are. Uh, church has a recognizable form as we focus on Christian community for a second. Um, how can you play with that form uh, within the norms of your tradition or maybe pushing the norms of your tradition so that it expresses these values? Um, so in the in the context of climate emergency, and if you think of climate emergency as a problem, uh, you, your building's uh, green features, as it were, are important and might be a way to express what you're feeling, might be educated uh, way to express uh, who you are, what you are, and who you, what, who you aspire to be. So I'm just looking, for instance, in this room, and you look at the arts in the room, uh, and this is, you know, an embrace of a decolonizing Christianity. So what does a Christianity that's gone through ecological conversion or uh, a community that's gone through ecological conversion, how is that reflected in their buildings? And um, how do you make those choices? Um, yeah, so so I'll just give quickly the, the one of the prime examples from uh, Catholic traditions in, in Ontario. There's this uh, parish that's St. Gabriel's Parish, uh, Passionist Parish, the same um, order of priests that Thomas Berry was from, as some of you know him. So he's the one that actually said, if you want healthy people, do you know what that's called? Yeah. Um, the passion's quote. Um, anyway, so that order, they had a church in suburban Toronto that was in the center of a huge parking lot. Uh, suburban Toronto is becoming more downtown Toronto. Um, they sold part of the land to make condos. And in sort of this canyon that was created by condos, they had this opportunity to rebuild their community. And they chose to rebuild it as the first LEED certified green building, uh, faith building in Canada. Um, everything is by original in that building, except for the limestone that comes from Manitoba because it has falcons in it to have that connection. They have a living wall. Um, their stained glass makes a light show on, on the wall, uh, this concrete wall, not the living wall, different wall. Um, the reconciliation room, um, call it a reconciliation room instead of a confessional, has that interplay so that, that if you go in the daytime, you're, you're you know, confessing to the priests, but you're also the universe is present with you. So they try to think of uh, flowing water for the baptism. They try to think of all these things that would reflect their value as a community outside of bioregional garden, uh, stations of the cosmic Christ outside. Cosmic way of the cross, they call it. So thinking of ways when you have opportunities to let the building express what you want to be. All right, and we'll do, I think we have time for our last two. Um, so we talked about uh, aspects of ecological conversion, and as you mentioned, there was some sort of question of direction, you know, depending on what background we came from, it was more becoming aware of the harm to creation rather than um, becoming aware of the value of creation. Um, different backgrounds, uh, farm backgrounds, getting involved in gardening is a thing that came up, and interest in organics and, and the community aspect of, of gardening. Um, and conversion in the realization that consumerism was not giving us the world that we wanted, and it was instead sort of consuming and disposing of the world. Um, so one really interesting example was um, um, a visit to Cuba and realizing that they had discovered accidental organic farming because they couldn't afford inputs. Um, in all of this, we noticed that we were talking about communal conversion to a large extent rather than that kind of an insight for one person. It was feeling like our communities were experiencing conversion. Um, then we also tackled question five about relevance. Um, the first reaction was, well, you practice what you preach. Um, we wondered whether churches could experience renewal if they're seen as leaders on these issues, that people would see the church as more relevant. Um, and then we realized that it's a real challenge sometimes in the church to be in that leadership position because 
Um, the church often represents the status quo, and there's a feeling that you shouldn't rock the boat. So it's very challenging to the to the church and the people in it to begin to be about change instead of about upholding traditions, uh, getting along, not upsetting anyone. That's what we talk about there also with Matt Hobbit. Um, I know I two minutes. Um, so I think this connection with uh, creation care and agriculture has been very important, particularly on the prairies. Um, there's communities that are dedicated to this, most prominently the Arosha community that some of you might have heard of, that takes a biblically based Christianity and tries, tries to apply it to stewardship of the land, living as a community. Very interesting group, Arosha. Um, I worked for the Organic Food Council of Manitoba and one of the first organic milk farmers in uh, Manitoba in the early 2000s was on the old Mennonite Reserve uh, near near uh, Winkler and Morden uh, in Rhineland, Manitoba. And we went out there and this is one of the villages that instead of being settled on squares, uh, they allowed them to have a strip going out to the square so they could have a village together in the Mennonite settlement. And his, um, I was I was there. Uh, they needed some hay bale, and I knew that that's how Gertie Howe got really strong. So I was like, "Can you do that?" Um, and so I stayed overnight um, when everybody we went for the tour of the of the facility, their organic um, milk production facility. Uh, and then I stayed overnight with them. And when they found out that I was studying religion, they shared their faith based motivation for wanting to do this organic work. And I'm not I'm not trying to put uh, organics on a pedestal. But for them, it was a way to preserve, uh, to enhance, to update their life as a small village in the context where agriculture was getting bigger, inputs were getting bigger, and it didn't seem like farmers were getting bigger. So rethinking, rethinking the way that like the technology is going to work is, is kind of really interesting uh, to me. And I know that this is something, uh, lower intensity agriculture is, for instance, something that the, the monks at St. Peter's Monastery in Munster, Saskatchewan are very interested in now uh, and working towards as well. Uh, again, as part of their efforts to uh, make not ever, so that everything doesn't become Saskatoon, Prince Albert, and uh, Regina, right? That there's other expressions of Saskatchewan agriculture. Um, and then the last thing in one minute uh, that I'm really drawn to in your comment is this tension between um, you know, the real struggle that a lot of Christian communities are going through, uh, depending on which community you're part of, um, a feeling of decline, a feeling of how do, how do we continue, um, and how that relates to this idea of relevance is connected to prophetic witness, and how costly that prophetic witness can be, um, and whether that's a cost worth paying, and that's a question, obviously, for each uh, community, but I do admire um, communities that look beyond the client to think of uh, creative ways that that's, you know, maybe a loss in numbers can mean that then you're a community center. Maybe then you're using uh, your church lot as a community garden. Maybe you have a big church, like in the center of Winnipeg, there's St. Matthew's Maryland. Uh, they do incredible things out of that church because um, they, they just don't have the, the numbers. They made their part of their sanctuary into community housing. They had community gardens. The Mantle of Food Charter was in there. Uh, really interesting opportunities that what others would see as the client uh, creates new possibilities for collaboration and um, maybe one of the prime ones uh, right now so for instance i'm now involved with the Catherine donnelly foundation that's an, um, an effort of the sisters of mission service uh, who don't have uh, the numbers coming in in terms of vocation but want to continue their good work the, with the capitalists called charism their charism in other forms, so they fund good projects. So rethinking what you can do with what you have, um, even if you're experiencing what others might call decline, I think is a really interesting moment for mainline Christians uh, in particular. All right, so that's exactly my time. And I really like to thank, um, wow. I don't like to thank uh, Tasha for uh, getting me to come down here. My wife is very grateful to have a day without all these four boys, you'll see. <laughs> um, so it was off she for all of us. So thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, as always, uh, if you ever have an opportunity to listen to Chris speak, 
I highly suggest that you take it. Uh, we gave him an impossible task and uh, and you did it. So we're just very impressed with that. So thanks so much.